Okay, welcome to today's uh, webinar on coalition building to end youth homelessness. Our two speakers today are Hugh Russell from <coughs> excuse me, um, Hugh Russell from End Youth Homelessness Cymru in Wales. And we have Anne Rummel from the Away Home Project Europe and from the Flemish Childcare Welfare Agency. Um, the two presenters are going to talk through their experiences in building coalitions to end youth homelessness and talk about their experiences and the value of those organizations and movements. You can ask questions throughout this webinar in the box to the right hand side of your screen and we'll be feeding those to the speakers during this session. Before we begin, I just want to do a quick presentation from my side. Um, share my screen. So at the moment you should all hopefully be able to see my screen. So this is our webinar for today on um, coalition building to end youth homelessness. I mentioned earlier the two speakers that will be joined by today. For those of you who might be interested, this isn't our first webinar and it won't be our last webinar. We've done a series of webinars already um, on the topics related to Housing First for Youth, Youth Homelessness and Trauma, and then today's webinar, of course, is Coalition Building. Next month, the date is still to be confirmed, but we will have a webinar on financing youth housing solutions. We'll be joined by Michelle Norris, who's chair of the Housing Agency in Ireland, and we'll be joined by NAL, which is the Youth Housing Association in Finland. And then on the 28th of May, we will have a webinar dedicated to LGBTIQ youth homelessness, where we'll be joined by Two Housing in Torino and Le Refuge in France. Both organizations provide housing and emergency accommodation specifically to LGBTIQ youth. I would also add that this is a webinar series that we have developed specifically for our work on youth homelessness. From next Wednesday, Fianza will be starting a new webinar series called Breakfast Bites. It will be a webinar that we will host every Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock Central European time, so 9 a.m. or 11 a.m., depending on where you are in Europe. Um, and each week, a member of the Fianza Network and our membership will present a policy area, a topic that they are working on to share with the wider membership network. I think as a response to COVID-19, many of our members have teams and staff that are working remotely. Um, it can also be quite an isolating experience and time at the moment if you're, if you're like myself, working from home. I think many people are on the call too. So it's an opportunity to get the professionals working in the sector across Europe talking to each other. And it's also an opportunity for some professional development and to learn different practices and services that are up and running in different countries across Europe. I'll share that information in the package after this call and if you are interested in joining i'll send you the links and if you are interested in being a presenter on one of the breakfast by sessions you can also get in touch to let us know i'm also just going to add that many of you may or may not be aware that the fianza membership has recently changed previously to be a member of fianza you had to be a national level organization working in the field um, of homelessness specifically as a service provider that has now changed. Um, they can be homeless services at local and regional level, not only working on a national level, but you can also join as affiliates and correspondents if you work for a city, a government ministry, an agency, a foundation or think tank. It's part of Fianza's work to broaden our, our remit and to bring other perhaps non-traditional actors into the fold that it's not simply homeless service providers, but it's a broader coalition. And you can see there are many benefits to joining the Fianza membership network, including policy development, joining our different thematic clusters to work on priority areas, learn best practices, transnational exchanges, and of course, the opportunity to network with other services across Europe. That's just a little bit about where what we are doing within Fianza. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Anne, Rommel, who is the, just one moment, and who is the, 
Okay, Anne, I think I've handed over so you're able to share your screen now. You should be able to. Anne yes. is the project coordinator for Away Home Europe. So, Anne, over to you. Maybe it would be good to start with a little bit about your organization and the project that you're working on. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, Robbie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I work for uh, the Flemish, Flemish agency uh, Opgroeien, Growing Up. Uh, we are quite a new uh, agency. Um, we are actually a um, fusion of the old uh, agency responsible for youth care and the agency that is uh, responsible for preventive uh, family policies. So we came together to uh, reinforce uh, the important preventive work. Um, and in that uh, agency, I am a policy officer um, working mostly around the topic of young adults and the difficulties that uh, the transition out of youth care uh, may have for uh, young people, uh, young adults. Um, so that's why uh, we also um, started this European project, the Away Home uh, project, two years ago, um, in which we actually wanted to develop strength-based aftercare policies, and in which we also wanted to reimagine solutions to end and prevent youth homelessness, uh, because I think you may all be aware that a huge part of the young adults who are homeless have a pass in youth care. So in our agency, there is a big uh, sense of urgency, feeling responsible uh, for these young people having a pass in youth care. So we as youth care providers and as the policy responsible uh, for uh, youth care should, should uh, deliver better work. Uh, so um, these are the partners uh, of um, this European project. Um, so at the University College is partner, Cachette is also a very important partner. They actually are um, uh, giving a voice to young people uh, who have left care and they are also started uh, by young people who have a past in care. So for us, they were a very important, um, how can I say, inspiration uh, and source of information also to uh, deliver better uh, results in this project. Fianza was an important partner. Um, and what is important to say is uh, that um, project activities had pilots in two countries, so in Flanders and also in Austria. Um, so in the Carinthian um, region, where we collaborated also with the government in Carinthia and with the youth care service provider, the Ocani de la Tour. Um, so I will first tell you a bit on what we did in this project. Uh, I will also show you some uh, results that you can also check after this uh, webinar on our Away Home uh, website. Um, and after I will then tell you something more about uh, the coalition that we have founded in Antwerp. Um, so that what we wanted to do in this project um, was uh, define and implement the clear aftercare policy for the entire youth care uh, sector um, with, uh, how can I say, a policy framework with guidelines, standards for youth care institutions. We also want to develop a toolbox uh, with methods supporting young people and professionals in the transition, in the period transition out of youth care. Uh, and we also have developed a peer group learning and training for professionals. Uh, then we also tried out the Canadian Away Home uh, model. I will tell you something later about this. And as already said before, we try to involve young people in all the project activities and take their experiences and needs and dreams uh, into account. Um, so we are really at the end uh, of this project. And this project was also funded by uh, the European Union's Rights, Equality and Citizenship uh, Programme. Uh, so, um, first I will tell you uh, something about, uh, so what did we do on this aftercare uh, policy? Um, on our uh, project website, you can find uh, a policy framework that can be uh, used, implemented by uh, youth care uh, providers uh, with six guidelines for a strength-based aftercare policy. Um, 
And in these guidelines, we focus really on individual strengths of young people. Uh, we really want to uh, put in place a community-oriented uh, youth care. So it is not only um, the responsibility of the youth care provider, but we really try to um, enlarge the network around the social worker, around the young person. Um, and of course, the voice of uh, youngsters is crucial uh, in all of this. Um, you can also definitely check our toolbox on the website. In this toolbox, we try to collect tools that can help support young people and their um, counselor in this trajectory. But it's also important to say when we ask the young people, what do you find of all these tools? Actually, they were not so um, convinced that this is the most important thing. They actually want that there is a good relationship between uh, the social worker and themselves. And that is actually the most crucial part of um, preparing them in a good way. Then the training and peer group learning in Austria and in Antwerp, there were, uh, I think, about 30 people who participated in the training. Um, and it was a lot about peer group exchange on how do they deal um, with the transition and how do they prepare their youngsters in the best possible way. Um, then a second part of this project, we started two away home uh, coalitions in Antwerp and in Villach. So um, Away Home Canada uh, is, I think, for all of us a big uh, inspiration, where they say it is crucial to start um, coalitions, coalitions of the willing to end and prevent youth homelessness. So where a lot of different actors uh, collaborate, um, uh, invest resources in a, in a different way in order to uh, start a real change in how we collaborate um, and in order to um, have better service delivery for these vulnerable uh, young people. So uh, what we did, so on the Away Home Europe website, um, you can find some key concepts, some guidelines, some resources if you want to start a local coalition uh, in your city. Um, in this project, so I will... Um, Tell you later something also what we all did in Antwerp, but so there were catalysts, catalyst events organized uh, to launch local stakeholders engagement. Um, there was a mission, vision and action plan uh, developed to end uh, youth homelessness. And also on our website, you can find uh, the actions that were developed in Antwerp uh, and in Villach. Thanks very much, Anne. Could you talk a little, talk us through a little bit how it worked in Antwerp? Because I know yeah. that there was already an existing organization, mm -hmm. and it was quite interesting yeah. to see how, rather than being in competition together, that there was a really good spirit of collaboration between the two. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when we um, applied with our project, um, we had written that Antwerp would be our pilot region because as it is a big city, there is also the biggest concentration of uh, homelessness of vulnerable young people and also the risk factors, um, uh, the, the figures of um, youth unemployment, um, uh, housing that is really uh, expensive. Uh, so it comes all there together. So we really wanted Antwerp as a pilot region. Um, and. But when we uh, got the answer that we uh, could go on with our project, we have found out that there was already an existing uh, collaboration, an existing network that was called Mind the Gap. And when we called them, they were really um, enthusiastic uh, to collaborate with us. Uh, so they uh, exist already from uh, March 2017. And actually, they were started as a network of organizations out of youth and adult care, housing, employment sector, to set up really concrete actions uh, for young care leavers. That was really their main focus. Um, but when we uh, uh, went to them with uh, the Away Home um, uh, plans and Away Home model, they were really very enthusiastic to uh, start to collaborate with us in order to have some more effective results and then also to enlarge their target group for all um, young people who uh, have a certain risk uh, 
to be hopeless um, because for example there are also young people um, at 20 who never have a bus in youth care but who uh, find themselves also in a very vulnerable situation so also for them we started uh, to develop um, actions so in 2018 uh, the mind the gap uh, became also partner of our away home uh, project um, so these are the partners we so in a short time we could uh, collect a lot of um, or resemble a lot of interested partners they are active in youth care adult care um, Foster care is also a very important partner, um, but on the other hand, there are also um, employment partners, housing partners, and also we have more and more a very good uh, collaboration also with the local government, um, which is in fact a very important driver to uh, implement also very uh, concrete actions. Um, so this is our uh, mission statement statement uh, that all young adults in Antwerp have a safe, supportive and nurturing home uh, and no young adult have the risk to be, to be homeless uh, or has risk of becoming uh, homeless. Um, and every young adult in Antwerp together with his network and her family uh, can count on good working services, accessible services uh, and also on the support he she needs to build a qualitative life in the various areas of life. So it is then about care, about housing, education, work, leisure, youth, um, and so on. Um, we, uh, for us, it was how can I say? It was a challenge um, because in the away home model, uh, it is very important to have um, an action plan. Uh, that proves that the actions that you do have an impact on the young people. And as there were already quite some actions running in Mind the Gap in which this impact-oriented work was not so present, that was, I think, the most uh, difficult thing uh, for us to do, to develop an action plan in which we would know, okay, the things that we do here, um, they will lead to uh, our goal that we have, um, ending and preventing youth homelessness. And for this, uh, the roadmap uh, that the uh, Away Home uh, Canada movement in, in um, Canada uh, developed was for us a very inspirational, um, big inspiration. You can find it on their website. We made our own uh, Antwerp, um, how can I say, um, a an, an roadmap for Antwerp, uh, but in which we also took over the six uh, levels of prevention that the Canadians say you have to work on these six levels of prevention if you want to end and prevent uh, youth homelessness. They are in Dutch and they are also not so well readable, but it is about strengthening st structural prevention, um, working on a system uh, prevention, um, have work on with early uh, intervention and detection uh, to prevent eviction from housing and to create stable uh, housing and the duty to assist I think that's a very important uh, thing that um, we also have learned from uh, Canada that uh, youth homelessness it is um, a violation of the human rights and this is a very uh, how can I say a very important driver connector of these 40 organizations. Um, if you say, okay, it is a violation of the human rights, we have a duty to assist, we have to do something. It is a very important driver, motivator for a lot of organizations to collaborate and to change the things they do um, uh, in the usual way. So we found this was for us a very uh, important thing. Um, so the levels of prevention, uh, I already uh, have showed them uh, to you in the roadmap. What, uh, what are examples of structural prevention? It is about increasing availability of affordable housing. Uh, it is about um, making sure that discrimination doesn't happen anymore. On system prevention, we focus a lot on the continuity between care systems because I think this is a really big cause of uh, homelessness or vulnerability because the care systems are not connected uh, to each other. 
we are also experimented with school-based early intervention. Um, we are thinking about housing first for youth uh, pilot, uh, and so on and so on. Um, on our website, for the moment, this is only in Dutch, but in the end of the project, I still will need I will make an English version of this, so then you will have also um, access to this. But on this uh, page, you can see an overview of the different actions uh, we do. Um, and if you go over it, this, um, they are sorted out by the six levels uh, of prevention. So uh, not all of them are already, uh, how can I say, implemented. It is our action uh, plan but quite a lot of them uh, are already uh, concrete. For example, we have created a, a walk-in house uh, in the two years that we are active. Um, and in this walk-in house, we want to be, uh, how can I say, for young people who are not known in uh, youth care or who do not want to be uh, connected anymore with youth care, uh, because sometimes a lot of of young people uh, are always are also tired of the care they received and they do not want to uh, uh, to receive the care anymore. We have a very low um, uh, a walk-in house with low thresholds where they can uh, shower, where they can uh, wash their clothes, where there is internet, where they can cook, where there is food, but where there is also sorry. Um, where there is also um, uh, where there are also care workers um, present, and where young people want uh, to be helped, um, they, there is a very uh, easy access uh, to uh, to the care workers. Um, and I think in this walk in house, we also really want to develop a network around the young people with uh, volunteers that are also present. And what is also very good is that the walk in house is part of a bigger youth center, uh, so it is a close, um, safe environment within this uh, youth center, but we can make an easy connection to the other activities taking place there if the young people want this and are ready for it. For it. So we also have made an app um, in which people can find information, young people, how to get access to the uh, housing uh, market. There is a lot about um, networking um what um maybe also this is interesting we have a central um entry point um so we are working with we have a small pilot um because in antwerp i think maybe it's everywhere like this there is a lot of support um present uh, also living forms present but they Young people do not always find the best um, best support for them, and also uh, care workers amongst each other do not always know what exists. So we want to put all these uh, living forms with support together in a central entry point, but with this also organize a sort of um, case table when um, case workers. Uh, do not feel strong enough to handle very complex cases, that there is also an interdisciplinary uh, collaboration uh, between different sectors to support young people uh, in the best way. Um, so we work with the collective uh, impact model. Uh, you may be um, already aware of this. Uh, it also comes, uh, so uh, we, we we have had all our inspiration from Canada, uh, where they say, if you really want to do this uh, change, uh, have a change in the system uh, to um, ending and preventing youth uh, homelessness, you need a common agenda, you need um, mutual reinforcing activities, you need shared measurements, and you need continuous communication to talk about what you do and to enlarge um, your your uh, your partnership, your coalition, and you also very important. You need a backbone support. You need uh, people uh, who drive the coalition uh, forward. How did we put this in place in Antwerp? So uh, we are a collective of organizations with various functions, very um, 
various uh, organizations from very different sectors and we come together uh, three times a year in order to inform each other, um, to inspire each other and so on. Uh, and this collective of people, the Mind the Gap collective we call them, uh, they are mostly active in action groups that develop, implement and follow up the actions. These actions group, we have um, uh, five of them. It is prevention, living, continuity of care, networks and working at daytime activities. So they organize themselves and mostly they come together, I think, each uh, six uh, weeks. So it's quite um, uh, an intense work. But because it is um, at our meetings that are not just about talking, but about doing, we see that we can um, can keep on the energy uh, in the collective uh, and people really uh, come and participate uh, and engage uh, themselves. Um, these action groups have different, uh, how can I say, coordinators, and these coordinators are all uh, gathered then in the back office, the back uh, support, and we try to coordinate all the actions, uh, make sure that all the actions uh, deliver, uh, how can I say, um, results for uh, our target group. Um, we uh, communicate with um, governments, uh, we lobby for our, um, our mission and vision. Um, so I think that is a bit uh, the, the most important tasks of the best back office. We also um, focus on data collection. With this, we have to be honest, we still ha have a lot of work to do to see, okay, our uh, actions, um, which impact uh, do they have? So there we still have uh, quite a lot of work uh, to do. Sorry to yeah. interrupt, Anne, but we're yeah. running out of time for the first yeah. uh, presentation. Thank you. But I think I am, uh, I am ready. So if you want to ask me questions, please uh, mail me. Um, yeah. Perfect. Um, we're going to hand over to Hugh now, so I'm just going to set up for his presentation. And two quick reminders, if you have questions at the moment, you can feed them into the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. Um, one moment. Um, Hugh, can you? Yeah, you should be able to share your screen. Perfect. Um, and the other reminder is that we'll be sharing the presentations of everybody um after the webinar so any hyperlinks or things that people might have in their presentations you will be able to access so hugh over to you um you might introduce yourself and a little bit about your organization sure uh, can you see the go to meeting stuff on here am i am i sharing my screen okay you can see the presentation yeah. we can All see right. your screen and we can see you so great well hello everybody um I'm Hugh Russell, I'm the project manager for End Youth Homelessness Cymru. Uh, Cymru is Welsh for Wales. Um, you can follow us on Twitter there, just set up a Twitter account for EYHC. Uh, recently, we haven't got many followers, so please uh, let me take this opportunity to plug away. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to take you through, as, as Anne has just helpfully done, I'm going to take you through the background to our coalition approach in Wales um talk about what we've achieved talk about where we're going next and um first i'm going to start off with a little bit of context about the, the situation in wales and about wales as a country um so wales is a small country part of the uk uh three million people live here uh it's generally speaking a pretty poor country uh we know that a third of children living in wales currently live in poverty um the part of this is deindustrialized uh, large large chunks of the area are sort of deindustrialized post-industrial um areas where uh, famously coal was mined that's that's no longer happening uh, and a lot of the industries weren't replaced um the other thing that sort of uh, perhaps influences wales is uh, poverty is the uh, relative poverty to our neighbours in England is, is something called the Barnett formula which without getting into great detail is the method by which 
funding is distributed to across across the constituent parts of the UK um, and Wales. I think it's fair to say has a, a pretty raw deal on that. So the amount of funding coming coming from UK government into Wales is not necessarily proportionate to our need uh, as a country. Um, so we have an array of devolved powers. We have um, we have some of the for this for this area we're talking about here homelessness and uh, youth homelessness we have some of the key powers we need devolved to the welsh government which is great uh, or the welsh assembly government um so we have powers over housing uh, over education over health however um our ability to fund those areas is uh is influenced heavily by uk government uk government retains control over welfare for example so um the rents people are paying for social housing, for example, that is uh, uh, heavily influenced uh, by the amount of money that comes down from UK government. Um, that, um, yeah, I should say we have we have uh, limited tax raising powers here. So, um, yeah, there's 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 a degree of control in Wales over our uh, over our future as a country and our ability to uh, impact on issues like homelessness. But that is, that is tempered by the amount of power that's been devolved by UK government. Uh, so in terms of homelessness specifically, um, we collect data. Uh, local authorities are asked by Welsh government to collect data on presentations when somebody comes to present as homeless. Um, so in the last full year, we have uh, stats for those, those figures. Um, as you can see, 700 odd 16 and 17 year olds presented. And around 7,000 18 to 24 year olds presented in that year. That doesn't necessarily mean um, there were there were nearly 8,000 people who experienced homelessness. It just means there are 8,000 presentations, or just under 8,000 presentations. Um, I found a useful stat in uh, some work I'm going to come on to talk to you in a minute uh, about. But um, yeah, Harriet Watt University. Uh, estimated that on any given night in 2017 around 5200 households across wales were homeless um i talked about devolved powers about devolved legislation and wales has developed its own housing legislation um which was which was very progressive at the time and as part of that uh we have a duty to assist uh and talked about that and the need the need for that as part of part of a roadmap to uh ending homelessness so um, we're very fortunate here. We have a progressive uh, government which which sees homelessness as a as a real um, priority for them, and um, they've they've written in this duty to assist. So, in in brief, what that means is if you are uh, 56 days from homelessness, if you can show that your landlord has said they will turf you out in 56 days, two months' time, um, there's a duty then for your local authority to find help for you um you can argue about whether that goes far enough and we we certainly think there's, there's uh, room to improve in terms of prevention uh, and working much earlier with people but uh it is indicative i think of the progressive attitude to preventing homelessness in wales uh from government so and that's a bit you, of within yeah, the, yeah. this welsh context which i think is, is quite interesting how does mm. the youth homelessness and the coalition where does that come from Okay, yeah. Um, so um, I work for Clamai. Uh, Clamai has been going for over 30 years. It's a, um, it's a registered charity, a reasonably large organization uh, that works in Wales with, with two key groups. So um, we work with uh, women who are fleeing domestic abuse, who are made homeless due to domestic abuse. And uh, we work with young people who have been made homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, so, Clamai was part of, and in fact, led a, a campaign in 2016, um, focusing on that youth element, um, on uh, the use of bed and breakfast accommodation here. Uh, so, the thinking was that it was it's completely unacceptable, or remains completely unacceptable. Um, local authorities were placing young people in temporary accommodation, bed and breakfast accommodation, which uh, where they would often be sharing with 
with adults with uh, substance use issues, for example, or um, some cases violent histories. Um, and uh, this this was like unsupported in, in many cases. It was not suitable for uh, vulnerable young people who'd just been kicked out of home. So Plamai teamed up with uh, other provider organisations, other support providers in Wales, um, and ran this successful campaign uh, around the issue. So uh, it, was, it was successful to a point anyway. We had uh, guidance rewritten so that uh, to make it much harder for young people to be housed in that fashion by local authorities. We, um, I should have said in the context, you know, we've been um, living in, in a period of austerity for over a decade now, the UK government uh, cutting back on the amount it spends uh, on public services, including uh, or contributing to um, a lack of suitable accommodation for young people who've, who've been made harmless. Um, hence the need for local authorities or the perceived need by local authorities to house young people in this fashion. So um, yeah, so we, we sort of built this, this small coalition of like-minded organisations at that point. Um, we were successful in influencing government policy and uh, it was felt that, you know, this worked, let's go further, let's do more. Um, we'd, uh, yeah, we developed some ahead of steam and, and uh, wanted to go further, so um, we we looked as and as Anne talked about, um, we we're, were heavily influenced by uh, our friends in Canada. Um, we looked uh, across the Atlantic and and uh, borrowed heavily from uh, the collective impact approach, which uh, and and set out for you there. Um, and uh, we thought, let's let's take this momentum, let's take this this small coalition and develop it a bit further. Um, and so we started to think, looking at, at what the Canadians were doing, how can we apply some of that in Wales? How can we um, build a coalition like that in Wales? Um, as, as a well-established organization, we already had a lot of links with, uh, with all the organizations, the various different areas, which um, we wanted to, uh, we'd want to bring into a coalition. So um, it just it just felt like a really natural fit, I think, to take that momentum from the smaller campaign and expand it to a much bigger, uh, a much more definitive campaign to end youth homelessness, rather than uh, just influencing how it's managed or uh, making relatively minor differences, though, though important, like on the bed and breakfast campaign. Um, it was a much more ambitious aim. How can we? end youth homelessness altogether in Wales. And when we talk about ending it, uh, we're talking about making it rare, brief and non-recurrent where it does happen. Uh, this isn't about getting to absolute zero, um, but hugely reducing the amount of crisis support that's provided and instead bringing in much more preventative work so that young people don't have to go through this in the first place. So, um, yeah, I thought I'd talk a little bit about our structure, um, how how we've how we've developed a structure with the YHC. Um, this doesn't necessarily uh, this isn't necessarily sort of uh, taking influence from elsewhere. It's kind of using the resources and the people that we had available to us and um, and working. Uh, you know, we've 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 taken a lot of inspiration from Canada and more recently from uh, from the Rock Trust in Scotland and the way that they've developed there. Away Home Scotland model um, from from Anne and, and the team at Away Home Europe who take inspiration um, and we've learned a lot from uh, other other members of the Fiancé Youth Network. Um, but this this model, uh, yeah, was it's kind of yeah. I think I think a, a theme running through this is is probably about how uh, you take the inspiration, you go back to your own context, and then you you just work with what you've got and you make it fit your context. Um, so we set up a uh, strategic group. Now the idea of the strategic group was to have uh, like high level oversight of our work. Um, and we brought in some really uh, powerful figures. Um, we're a well networked organization, it's a small country. Um, so we were able to access some really powerful figures to come and um, act as sort of figureheads on this, on this coalition. Uh, so they included the first minister, who is extremely supportive, a guy called Carwin Jones, 
Um, the actor Michael Sheen, who had been uh, the face of the End Better Breakfast campaign, um, and then uh, other figures such as the leader of the Welsh Local Government Association and uh, the Children and Future Generations Commissioners. Uh, they all signed up to a set of principles uh, around ending youth homelessness. We set a target of 2027 to get to, to our goal. Um, that's, that was a 10 year period. Um, and we felt it was important to set a target so that um, so the work got done, so that this was taken forward, that uh, we didn't just set an indefinite um, goal and, and then just plod on. We wanted to see some urgent action. So we, we set this target, they signed up to that um, and, and to principles of working in an evidence-led fashion, working in a youth-informed fashion, um, working, uh, working towards prevention, as I talked about, rather than continuing to uh, rely on, on crisis interventions. Um, and then beneath the strategic group, we set up a steering group. Uh, this is a much bigger group, really broad representation. I think that it's at its biggest, there were around 40 members. Um, and for that, for, to, to bring that together, we thought about the different policy areas that uh, a young person has to sort of be failed by to become homeless, uh, whether that's mental health or uh, ultimately housing. Um, we wanted representatives of, of these different areas in whatever guise, whether they came from the voluntary sector or from um, government or uh, independent organizations to some uh, private industry uh, came on board at an early point. Um, and uh, yeah, people, people were really happy to give up their time. They, they, uh, we set out this common goal and people were really keen to get involved. Um, we set up initially with quarterly meetings. Uh, I won't get into the, the practicalities of it too much. Maybe people can ask about that in questions at the end. Um, we, at one of these early meetings, um, we made sure we had uh, Mel Melanie Redmond, for example, from Canada, uh, phoned in to one early on to sort of give us some inspiration and, and further guidance, I suppose. That was really helpful. And we've subsequently heard from other partners, um, the Irish Coalition of, of uh, Skyped in for meetings to show us what's going on there. And um, we were really uh, fortunate to have uh, visit from a representative of, of the Scottish Coalition. Um, so that's that's helped to, to G us along, I think. And um, uh, yeah, for me, it's, it's really important that we're taking inspiration from others and, and sharing that. Um, that's been a that's been a big uh, learning point for me for this. This is how how much we can borrow from elsewhere and then apply here. <clears throat> um, we broke down the issue of youth homelessness into uh, more manageable chunks. Um, we looked at some of the, the key demographics, the key groups who are going to be most uh, affected by youth homelessness or who were being most affected by youth homelessness. And we looked at some of the key systems involved and we, uh, we broke the work down a bit. So we started out with uh, a series of, of subject specific groups with reps from the steering group on them, uh, which I ran and um, we would then invite people uh, working in those fields to come and join us as well. Uh, and if they've been um, the mixed mixed success with each of these, um, so uh, really successfully uh, worked on LGBTQ uh, plus youth homelessness. Uh, we had the, an organization called Stonewall Cymru, an LGBTQ rights organization. Um, their director came and chaired that group for us and we brought in academics and uh, other folk working in the sector um, who, who we worked with over the course of a year uh, to develop between them and uh, some young people who we trained as peer researchers uh, to develop our thinking on, on the issue of LGBT youth homelessness um, and to develop a report called Out on the Streets, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, then uh, another one that's been really successful is care, uh, the care system and, and how that often, how, how young people are coming out of that. Again, as Anne, Anne mentioned earlier, um, we've got a system here which is designed to support people. And yet we, we have this incredible rate of sort of, uh, of young people leaving that system and either immediately going into homelessness or shortly thereafter becoming homeless. Um, 
so that seemed like a really obvious one to start with. Um, the other ones we looked at initially were uh, mental health and youth homelessness, um, and education and youth homelessness. And honestly, both of those were, um, we had, again, really willing groups of people come together for us, but um, they were both difficult to get into for their own, for their own reasons. Um, in both cases, there was an awful lot of work going on on a policy level um, to influence and inform how those, how those areas uh, move forward in Wales. Um, for example, we've got a new curriculum coming in in Wales. Um, so uh, we found it really difficult to find space actually to, uh, to change policy in those areas. And, and we've certainly on education, we've, we've come to a, a kind of what we think is a, a better way of working with that rather than uh, directly trying to influence policy. Uh, we're looking at uh, an education based intervention and how EYHC can support that. I'll come on to talk about in a bit. Um, a little bit about the operational team. So, so Clamai is the sort of the backbone organization, as, as Anne put it. Um, and within Clamai, we have a, an operational team of two uh, myself and uh, a policy and research officer, Gemma, who's absolutely fantastic. Um, so she's currently working on, on care research for us. Um, we're funded by Welsh Government and by a, a couple of trust funds as well, the Sir Halley Stewart Trust and the Esme Fairburn Trust. Um, we're coming up on the 20 minutes, Hugh, but could you talk us through some of the results um, that you've achieved as a coalition? Yeah, yeah, gladly. Um, so we've, um, we've had great buy-in uh, from the outset from Welsh Government for this work, and that has transformed into money. Um, I suppose, uh, first of all, that the, the first big step they took was to ask the Wales Centre for Public Policy to pull together a, what turned out to be Preventing Youth Homelessness, which is an international evidence review, uh, which looks at what worked in other countries. And in fact, it was, it was uh, predominantly written by the Canadians. They were uh, sort of subcontracted as, as leaders in their field. Um, so there's a link in the presentation to that. It was absolutely fantastic. It talks about that typology that Anne mentioned of, of structural systems, prevention, etc. Um, and then it gives examples of, of systems that have been developed around the world to address those areas. So we've taken a lot from that. It's been really inspiring. So there's a link in this uh, in this set of slides, which Robbie, I think you're happy to share. Um, and then, um, yeah, from that there was uh, funding was made available then. Um, prevention funding, so uh, three and a half million quid for uh, youth workers to get involved in preventing homelessness. Uh, nearly five million given over to innovative approaches, so we could take uh, we could take a stab at delivering some of the stuff that's in the preventing youth homelessness report. Um, so that's enabled, for example, housing first for youth uh, pilots to go ahead. So we've got six of those going. Um, and then other, other fairly innovative approaches to youth homelessness were taken forward with that funding, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, Welsh Government have also set up the Homelessness Action Group, which I'll come on to talk about a little bit more later. Um, LGBTQ youth homelessness, I talked about, we've, we've had a big impact here, I think. The report came out, uh, we had this brilliant coalition, we had a film funded by local authorities, which again, the link is in the slides, uh, which we used to provide just a different approach to um, to draw attention to this this work, and that's been really effective. They're still being shown at film festivals and stuff. Um, and then that that's transformed into results on the ground. We've we've got the first LGBTQ supported housing project for young people has come about off the back of this work. Um, we've got local authorities who've told us that they've changed their policies to uh, to be more aware of LGBT young people and how they can better support them. Uh, and, and across Wales, we've had loads of opportunities to raise awareness of, of uh, some of the, the key issues on this on this subject. Um, the other big, big area of impact is on uh, Upstream Cymru. I talked to you a little bit earlier about education and how we were getting involved in education. Um, and rather than just trying to influence policy, we, we did try that. Um, we've, we've decided to sort of put all our eggs in the basket of uh, upstream Cymru. So this is based on the Geelong project, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. Um, and uh, the, the, the key principles of it are that we screen young people, young people, every young person in a school with 
subject to permission, will undertake a, uh, an assessment, a survey, uh, which asks questions directly about their housing situation, uh, amongst other areas. We then look at that data with the schools. We have services already in place in the schools so that every young person that gets picked up as being at risk is then um, there's someone to work with them. Um, and we hope that that will enable us to work much earlier with young people rather than waiting for crisis to hit, for a family to break down, a kid to be kicked out of home. Uh, we hope we can pick up on that stuff so much earlier with, with this approach. Uh, and that's certainly the, the finding in Australia. Um, they've also, another really key finding on, on this is um, that they, by screening every young person in the school, rather than just uh, looking at the ones, the young people they think are at risk because of low attainment or low attendance or whatever other factor they already know about, by screening everybody, they found a really high proportion, both in uh, Australia and the US, really high proportion of young people who uh, were not previously known to services who were found to be at very high risk of homelessness. The people who are quiet, perhaps, and see school as a place of refuge. So we're we're pushing on with a pilot of that in, in Wales. I think um, that's a really good example of where our coalition has come together in a really practical way, and members of the coalition have, have all fed into this work. Um, so yeah, there were, that, that I would consider, even though we haven't actually, we were basically on the point of screening our first schools when this bloody virus kicked in. Uh, so uh, yeah, that, that will, I think, I'm sure, based on the results uh, found elsewhere, I'm sure that will have a big impact in Wales in our identification of, of youth homelessness and risk thereof. No, I think there's some really, really impressive things that you've, you've done so far. And maybe just to wrap up a little bit about what comes next for your coalition. Well, thanks, Robbie. Yeah, um, so yeah, we'll be taking uh, upstream Cymru much further. Um, you know, hopefully in a year's time, be able to come back to you all and talk about the results we've achieved with that. That's going to be that's going to be huge. Hopefully, uh, really um, change change how we approach youth homelessness in Wales. Um, otherwise, we've got this uh, report coming out um, where we've we've spoken to young people across the country about their experiences of care and homelessness, how they came to find themselves leaving the care system and becoming homeless. Um, so that'll be out soon. Um, much more in terms of political engagement. Um, as Anne said, uh, lobbying is a large part of this. We need to keep youth homelessness really high up the agenda. And um, as part of our work on that, we've, uh, we've, sit, we've sit on this group called the Homelessness Action Group, which uh, our minister is, our housing minister has just endorsed the recommendations to come from that group as again a, a sort of very collaborative um, group bringing together people from, from different areas who um, have come together with these, these, they've pulled together some great recommendations on how we can tackle homelessness broadly. We've input into that from a, a youth homelessness perspective. We've seen um, some success in, in terms of, you know, the minister has agreed to the recommendations of that group. Uh, one of the recommendations of the group, or, or certainly in the report of that group, is uh, the idea that youth homelessness is a distinct issue which needs to be tackled in its in a distinct fashion. Um, so uh, yeah, we're really uh, we're really pleased about how that's going. Um, part of that work, part of getting to that point, was was talking to that group about the fiancé definition of of youth homelessness, which I'm, I'm sure Robbie can talk further about, but. Um, that has helped us enormously that, that having that sort of European buy-in um, almost legitimizes our cause for youth homelessness to be to be taken seriously as a distinct issue, I think. Um, and finally, the, the next big thing for us is we've, we've built youth engagement into everything we do, but um, it's been sort of subject specific. So uh, this is something we really want to address is, is how can we make youth engagement much more just a fundamental process we go through whenever we're doing any work rather than um yeah we, we want to pull together a group that works for young people who can who can really feed into and, and ultimately drive this work forward um so i'm hopeful actually that some answers to how we do that come out of uh work we're hoping to do with away home europe um an ap university in the next year or two uh yeah i think i think that's about it great okay i'm going to 
take back the control of the screen and if you want to turn on your video as well um, and we can have a little conversation amongst the three of us maybe just to start to say um Hugh mentioned the definition of youth homelessness it's a piece of work that we've been working on in Fianza for about maybe the last year we're going to publish it next week uh hopefully next Tuesday or Wednesday and we're also setting up a webinar to discuss it and what the framework will do is it provides an overview as to what, as an organization, Fianza defines youth homelessness as, looking at ages, looking at needs, profiles, the diversity of experience, and to kind of act as a one-stop document to say, this is what youth homelessness is, because frequently we find that different services, governments, even within countries, let alone across Europe, they talk about youth homelessness from very, very different perspectives. And so this is an attempt to, I guess, create kind of a common, um, a common cause. So if anybody has questions, they can throw it into the box on the right hand side. But I actually have one myself that I think came up consistently from the two presentations. So I think something that was raised a lot was the importance of young people and their voice. And, and you mentioned Cachette and how important that was as an organization. And Hugh, you mentioned a few times the peer researchers and youth engagement. Could you talk a little bit about why for you and the coalition building, the voice of young people is so important and maybe some tips that people might have to, to make that contribution meaningful because often the fear sometimes is, is it becomes tokenistic um, and obviously mm -hmm. that's not what we want to achieve with yeah. mm -hmm. people. Yeah. But I think, uh, but as Hugh Corso said in his uh, presentation, it is uh, for most a big challenge, I think, to um, uh, integrate the voice of young people in such a big uh, systematic um, story. So I think we are quite successful in integrating their voice in very concrete actions. For example, in the Walk-in House, they were really uh, closely um, involved in what would we want to do there? How should it look like? Um, so I think when you ask them to give their feedback on very concrete actions and if they think this action um, is relevant, I think it's quite easy to organize a focus group or uh, ask the young people who are already in your service. Um, what I think as for uh, Hugh said, it is a big challenge to do it the whole time. And I think this we want to uh, address in a new project. Um, so we uh, do not have yet uh, a go. Uh, we still have to apply for it in the Erasmus Plus call. But there actually we want to um, develop uh, methods, um, way of working on how we can do this uh, the whole time. Um, and I think why it is important, this way home um, model, I think it is a successful model because it is a participative model, it is a model grounded in co-creation um, with all kinds of stakeholders. And then of course young people uh, should be one of the most important stakeholders because it's for them we are doing it and they can tell us the best what they have missed what they need um what they dream of and it's only like this we can really uh, in, in implement actions that really make a change for them and not yeah. think we think always they need that but it's not always the case uh, sometimes we also miss misinterpret things so i think it's really important but it is not an easy thing to do no, certainly not always. Hugh, what about from uh, your side in Wales? Yeah, not not a great deal to add to Anne's answer there. I thought we had a meeting about uh, this prospective Erasmus Plus funding uh, not long ago with a number of areas who are, who are um, looking at uh, looking at this coalition approach to youth homelessness, and I was struck at that meeting by how we all were saying the same stuff about uh, youth engagement. Um, on a subject specific basis, uh, it, it's pretty straightforward, it, it's relatively straightforward to get young people to to um, to work with us and, and uh, to make that meaningful, I think, and, and by bringing in partner organizations who, um, much like, like Cachette, we, we work with an organization called Voices from Care Cymru, who, who represent the young people who are 
a care experience than living in Wales. Um, so that's that's been quite a, a relatively straightforward way of, of, of approaching it for us is to work with organisations who who are already experts in exactly this sort of uh, youth engagement and indeed working for a service provider as I do with FAMI, um, we've been led by young people for a long time in, in how we work. Um, but yeah, those, those bigger structural changes, getting young people to uh, feel comfortable to um, help with, with that stuff on an ongoing basis, uh, we haven't yet figured out, we don't have an answer to that. I think we, we're, again, I, I have to praise our government and the way they, they respond to these issues. They, um, they do build youth voice into, uh, into this work quite often. Um, there are areas where we've had to push for that. Um, uh, there, was, there was, for example, recently we, we uh, had a, a panel looking at affordable housing supply in Wales and how that uh, could be taken forward into the future and, and what needs to change there. And uh, we had to push quite hard uh, to make sure the young people's voices were heard in that. And I think that's that's a key role for, for EYHC is to make sure young people's voices are heard in any uh, forum that is relevant to uh, preventing this homelessness. Um, yeah. Okay. And if anyone has any questions they want to ask again, you can feel free to throw them into the questions box. Um, if not, I have one last question that came to mind in your presentations was around the importance of partners and having, because that's the coalition building, if you're in a coalition, you're not on your own as an organization. But something that really struck me um, from both presentations was just managing the sheer number of partners. So from Anne, from the Mind the Gap in Antwerp, the list of partners, the logos, it was huge. Um, mm -hmm. I think you, you mentioned at one point there was 40 people on the either the steering or the strategic group. Um, how valuable has their input been? Uh, I think extremely valuable. Um, I think maybe our organization is a bit different as the one Hugh is uh, presenting. Um, I don't know if they are a steering group. We uh, say they are for we have 40 organizations uh, present in our collective, but when there are meetings, we are sometimes with uh, 80 people um, present, but that is then more on uh, communicating and um, brainstorming together on uh, different actions on how to push certain actions forward. But the real work is in the action groups, and there mm -hmm. mostly people are with uh, 15 uh, present. Um, that's mm. more manageable. But I'm also quite impressed that it uh, functions uh, and that people um, uh, still come to the collectives. We are always a bit afraid, or maybe we will only have three people present, but there are always a lot of people because I think everyone feels that we do something very concrete. Um, yeah. So we, ha we really have uh, chosen for this action-oriented approach. I think a following step is um, more doing also the um, political work where Hugh also uh, talked a lot about. And I think this we still have to, to manage to do that in a better way. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's anyhow a long term work. So uh, I think we, we are quite some years busy with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly one of the more challenging parts of this work, I suppose, is how uh, how you engage meaningfully your partners, how uh, how to ensure everybody feels like they're contributing, everybody feels can see the impact of their contribution. I think that's uh, that has been challenging. I think as a collective, having that having that broad uh, group of people, you know, from from LGBTQ organizations to housing associations to academics, all these all these organizations together. Um, has has helped us with with that political influencing. Helped us to have the impact I talked about. Um, our chair would would say, you know, and, and does say frequently that we are we certainly more than the sum of our parts in this. We, we as a as a collective, we can have much greater impact. Um, and um, which is that's great on the one hand. On the other, how do you how do you manage those people and and uh, ensure that they feel uh engaged i think we we probably bit off more than we could chew uh to begin with in terms of the numbers of groups we were trying to set up and the amount we were trying to run and um 
there was there was a danger that we spent more time uh, administering these different meetings, et cetera, than, than doing the sort of impactful work. So we've, we've uh, reduced the number of meters, meetings we're having um, and we keep people updated, uh, hopefully to a, to a, a meaningful extent that they, they still feel involved. Um, we just ran a really good conference, uh, probably the last conference for the 10 for a little while, um, <laughs> to, help, to help our partners to see where where this work is going in Wales. And um, hopefully that's, that's helped keep people enthused about what we're doing um, everybody involved will have a role to play whether they played it uh, individually yet or not um, and it's it's on yeah it's on us as a team to make sure that people maintain that level of, of motivation I suppose uh, to stay involved until such time as we need to call on them to, to work on whatever it is we're working on. Okay. I have a question from a participant, um, I guess for both of you. So do you meet much resistance from social services when you are trying to help with care experienced young people? In my experience, they don't believe there is an issue. Poof. Um, no. Yeah, uh, we've, we've found uh, the social workers, we, I think, by by starting from the beginning with a, a group of people working in the field and bringing in some really uh, motivated people from the beginning who who can act as our ambassadors in that field, um, we've we've helped to overcome some of that uh, initial uh, those initial barriers, I suppose. Um, but uh, you know, we we'll publish this report soon, and we'll see what sort of uh, kit back we get from that um, you know I, I think we're, we're very we're very careful to be collaborative and constructive uh, we certainly were with the LGBT report the, the recommendations in that are for very positive constructive change that everybody can make to improve young people's lives and I don't think anybody who works in 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 a field such as social work could can argue with that we uh, by presenting working as i said earlier that, that evidence base working in evidence informed uh fashion and working with the voices of young people makes our arguments um hopefully very uh strong coherent arguments and, and no matter the field you work in you you'd hopefully be influenced by them that's that's the thinking um so we've i'd say no we on, on balance we've not had a great deal of uh resistance to that work but we've put a lot of work into making sure that we don't. Hmm. Yeah, I think evidence and communication is key. And have you... Um, yeah, I, I think the resistance doesn't come from, um, well, in my experience, um, doesn't come from that people uh, think there are no problems, but I think resistance sometimes is there because people are already overwhelmed by a lot of things they have to do. Yes. Um, and I think yeah. sometimes the resistance comes uh, from there. Um, but I'm quite, how can I say, optimistic because in the Mind the Gap group, of course, only people who feel uh, the motivation there are present, they are not the people who feel the resistance, but they are convinced that by collaborating the problems they have in their individual work, um, they are less uh, heavy because they have this collaboration, they have colleagues, They it is, makes it easier for them. And I hope that this uh, pilot work will convince at the end everyone that collaboration is uh, the the way forward, but sometimes I can uh, understand that social workers just feel overwhelmed and and um, because it is quite challenging work they do. Um, so I think this is a bit the experiences mm. I have. Um, two more questions. Um, one is around the. Sorry, just get the questions back up. It's around the role of employment. So to what level do you focus on the importance of having a job and a sustainable income to support the solutions to exit homelessness? And I guess also really to prevent homelessness. And the second is around tools for measurement. We talk a lot about having an impact, about making changes, doing a lot of advocacy, but how do you know when your coalition has had that impact? And then a third question, for, just for you, is the peer research you mentioned earlier, uh, do you know when that will be completed? So peer research, tools for measuring success, and the role of employment. Um, go on, Anna. 
Yeah, yeah. I just want to say something on the role for employment. Um, in Mind the Gap, we are now starting um, an action group that will be active on this because I think it's a very important issue. Um, and I think we will mainly focus on the connection between uh, youth care and, um, how can I say, um, people of the public service office. Do you say it like this? Public service. Um, uh, yeah, the, the government organizations that follows the people looking for a job. Um, I think we have to connect them um, because there is not always um, know-how on uh, the, the challenges young people uh, have uh, and enough to give them also enough time and not to put too much pressure. So I think we will focus on this in the next year, but it's definitely a big, uh, should be a big priority. And for the rest, I think for the impact strategic learning, I think we are also a lot searching still. So for this, I do not have uh, a good answer. I hope you can. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say that one. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so on the peer research into care experience and homelessness, um, quite honestly, our our schedules have just changed quite dramatically. <laughs> uh, so in terms of uh, final release for the report, um, I honestly don't know. I mean, uh, we'd we'd been hoping to release it uh, in May um we'd want to do a launch event etc and all that's that's been uh, thrown into the air recently so um but we we have we're now working from home and, and um have much more time to sit down and write up our findings so far um so we we had luckily just finished uh data collection working with the young people so um we yeah we should have hopefully we can have a report written up in the next next few weeks um uh if maybe if i let robbie know when that's when that's ready to be shared you can put it into a fiance newsletter or something robbie absolutely we'll share it with the monthly the flash which is fiance's monthly uh, newsletter fab thank you um then uh the other questions the one on data um yeah it's it's really tricky it's really challenging um i'm coming to the conclusion that what we need to do is, is inform how government collect data better um so for example on, on lgbtq plus youth homelessness we, we've included a recommendation in there about um about collection of data around that particular issue which is sensitive issue um but ultimately we we just do not know how many young lgbtq plus young people are, are, are coming through our homelessness systems at present and um in as sensitive a fashion as we as we can do it we we need to be asking that question if we want to make sure that we've got uh justification for the funding needed to provide the requisite support um mm. so um yeah data is something we're we sort of bubbling over as we go and, and trying to influence as best we can um i think our work with i mean we, we've got some great great academics working in in wales um, and this this issue was already on the table on how we can improve um, data collection. Um, and I think actually maybe just to jump in on the, the challenges of collecting mm -hmm. data on young people experiencing homelessness, like the vast majority of young people who experience homelessness are outside of the traditional yeah. data collection systems. They're sofa surfing, they're not known to services. And it's interesting, I can't remember if it's either Denmark or Finland, but they now have questions that social uh, not social workers, but the people who work in social welfare. So if you go and you want to claim unemployment benefit or housing benefit or any sort of um, form of social welfare, they ask, they now ask you questions around your housing situation. And so it's not just about knowing, like, are you homeless or not, but they can identify if people are sofa surfing. Uh, so it's a new way of getting that data that traditionally right. you can't get because obviously if someone's not coming to a homeless service and they're using alternative forms of accommodation, they're outside of your, um, your data collection mechanism. So I think that is quite an interesting way to try and broaden the system. Yeah, it's great. Um, I think I should add that um, as Upstream Cymru, 
one of one of the key benefits of running upstream Cymru is we're going to get loads and loads of data um, yeah. working with uh, uh, Dr. Peter Mackey at Cardiff University, who um, world leading expert on on homelessness. We're really fortunate that he's he's part of what we're doing. He's um, uh, he's going to be analysing the data and he's really driven upstream Cymru forward actually he's been absolutely fantastic to work with but he, he'll be getting all this this population level data about young people and, mm. and their housing situations uh, which will give us you know unprecedented uh, information about uh, about youth homelessness in Wales mm. that's going to be huge there was another question Robbie that I don't think I've answered uh, the employment uh, employment yes yeah and you too as well yeah um, yeah, just just to add to that, we're we're doing some work. Um, my colleague Gemma uh, is uh, had actually previously worked in um, an organisation helping young people move uh, who are at risk of homelessness uh, move into the construction sector. Um, so building on that, she's she's got some links with um, Australian academics, and she's she'll be writing a paper on uh, how the construction sector can help uh, young people. Uh, uh, move on from homelessness or avoid homelessness altogether. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, I want to close the webinar now. I think we've gone a little bit over time, but I think the conversation and the questions were, were really interesting. So again, a big thank you to Hugh and Anne for joining us today and to all the participants for participating and joining. Um, on Monday, we'll be sending out more information to the presentations, a link to the recording, um, and all that stuff will go out. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a nice afternoon and weekend. Bye. Great, thanks, you. Bye.